Welcome to Fat Logic, where people use logic that keeps them fat. The first thing is about a cringy thing Elon Musk tweeted. Peter H. Diamandis, MD. Sugar is poison. Elon Musk. I eat a donut every morning. Still alive. Agri foods and health. Sugar is not poison. Excess sugar is. Apparently, Elon Musk is unaware that something can both be poison and not instantly kill you. But then again, Elon Musk is unaware of many things. Like how to run Twitter. Can I ask for a friend brings us. A person writes, Booty building programs marketed to white women are actually a form of cultural appropriation. This is so dumb. While there might be a genetic component to where you store fat, anyone can build a more muscular butt. For proof, go see Olympic gymnasts of every nationality. Bit mad, isn't it? Brings us. I guess this is on Amazon. One star fat shaming pack. Now I know that I've gained some weight since I hit my 50s, but this pack did nothing short of inform me how bad it's gotten. As if I didn't already know, I couldn't get the waist torso belt to connect comfortably in any position. Uh, non sentient things cannot shame you. Sorry. Flora's history brings us some truly horrific comments on here today. I'm staying positive today. For me and for her. And no, I'm not obese. But I knew somebody who was, and all he used to eat was a slice of toast and a slice of cheese a day. Now stop being nasty. So let me get this straight. He was obese, but ate less than an anorexic person? Somebody's lying. Another one from Fat Logic. It's a picture of 10 donuts. Virgie Tovar. Last weekend, I went to two donut shops in Fresno that were completely sold out of donuts. I asked the second shop what was happening. She said that she noted that on rainy days, people ate more donuts. Interesting. Leaving a second donut shop empty-handed was frankly too much for my fragile mind. I began to experience a new feeling. Donut panic. Fear that all donuts on the planet have been eaten, and you will never find another one. I hope those ten donuts are for her to share with friends. But knowing fat activists, I can't be sure... Can I ask for a friend brings us? It's Reagan Chastain. People of all sizes have knee pain, knee injuries, and mobility challenges, and so being becoming thinner is neither a sure preventative nor a sure cure. Yeah, and when you have cancer, getting chemotherapy isn't a sure cure either, but it's still recommended. Lacunaithra replies, There's no such thing as a sure preventative from injuries, pain, or disease. But sure as heck, there are actions that reduce these risks, that is, not being morbidly obese, refraining from doing anything that might help you, because it doesn't guarantee physical integrity, is severely unhealthy mindset, and I am worried about those who spread, and those who readily absorb such thoughts. Can I ask for a friend brings us another one. It's an infographic. It says sugar and fruit. And it's got a picture of grape, oranges, apples, watermelon, strawberry, and a blueberry muffin. It doesn't matter. Just pick what you like. Sometimes I like my fruit in a muffin. Actually, it does matter. People who eat up to five servings of fruit tend to have longer lifespans, whereas people who eat more than 25 grams of sugar a day, which isn't even all that much, tend to have shorter lifespans. So that means five of these choices have a tendency to increase your lifespan, and one of them tends to shorten your life. Dorkita brings us. This is garbage. It's a picture of a wastebasket. This is food. And it's a picture of uh, three meals at McDonald's. All food serves a purpose. None of it is garbage. I'm sorry, but the soda they show is about two servings of soda. One can of soda has more sugar than you should get in an entire day. So unless you're starving or dying of thirst, literally, not metaphorically, then that soda is trash. It should not be consumed by anyone. This was in mildly interesting from someone called Follow-Ups. They found out that Cookie Crunch cereal has 12 grams of sugar per serving. But Honey Nut Cheerios, which they considered to be an adult cereal, also has 12 grams of sugar per serving. 
you might have noticed that a serving of cereal is actually very small. So the amount that a normal person would actually eat would already put them at the maximum amount of added sugar per day. Hackabilly replies, part of a nutritious breakfast. Distinct dark. Notice the picture of a complete breakfast always includes fruit, juice, and some other healthy items. Those are what makes it complete, not the cereal. This one was in Fat Logic. It was kind of weird. They're talking about a certain Japanese noodle that's very low in calories. But these diet foods have existed in Japanese culture for centuries. Buttercup, I guarantee you if any culture ate your low-calorie poop noodles in any significant capacity for any significant time, they would have starved to death. Stop using minorities to uphold diet culture and stop using historical revisionism to push a diet food that could actually kill you. You nasty fudging hater of people who are different than yourself. And no amount of trying to convince me it really was a staple food for many years is going to convince me that because it's just not possible. The ideal caloric intake to avoid adverse health effects is not only in reality 500 calories or more over what's recommended, but you're not going to be able to even absorb in a survivable amount of calories eating a food that's designed to fill you up with only a few calories. Shut the fudge up and think critically in the nicest possible way. Overton's Horseshoe. Ah, uh, the Calling Japanese Food Low Quality Poop Noodles School of Anti-Racism. Does this person not know that when you eat noodles, you don't just eat noodles? Well, at least most people. They usually put things on them like oil, vegetables, fish, meat, sauce. So while it might seem you're eating five calories of noodles, you're actually probably taking in closer to 500 calories because of all the other stuff. And you've stopped wasting your calories on noodles, which add very little in terms of nutrition. This one is also on Fat Logic. Are there any completely reliable methods of weight loss besides mega liposuction and adipotide? By completely reliable, I mean that their theoretical and pragmatic efficacy is not subject to revocation by quirks of metabolic disprivilege. So starve yourself doesn't work because its pragmatic efficiency relies on your fat cells being willing to relinquish lipids before your body cannibalizes muscle tissue and otherwise starts doing serious damage to itself which your fat cells can just refuse to do if you're metabolically disprivileged. Mega liposuction and adipotide don't care if your fat cells are malfunctioning and refusing to release lipids. They just physically kill or remove fat cells. Anything else like that, or which operates at a similar level of disregard for metabolic disprivilege? Interventions that operate orthogonally to malfunctioning fat cells or other metabolic disprivilege only, please. I will delete comments suggesting diet or exercise. If you actually had a disease that prevented your fat cells from releasing the energy that they absorbed, I hate to say it, but you're probably not going to live very long. Your fat cells would keep expanding and expanding, till eventually they smothered you to death. I have a hard time believing that this person actually suffers from this, and they're not just miscounting their calories. But if they do suffer from this disease I've never heard of, then I feel very bad for them. Naked Lobster brings us. The diet industry likes to say you can't diet, you have to have a lifestyle change, by which they mean you change to a lifestyle where you diet all the time. The truth is that whatever you call it, intentional weight loss fails the vast majority of the time. Grouchy Reflection brings us some statistics that I thought were true but hadn't actually seen before. On average, it takes 7 to 8 attempts to leave an abusive relationship. It takes 8 to 11 attempts to quit smoking. Only 8 to 12% of Alcoholic Anonymous members achieve complete sobriety. Then there's things like cancer survival rates, organ transplant success rates, life expectancy for genetic dis disorders, etc. So it's no surprise that people, when they try to lose weight, have roughly the same kind of success rates. Because it's not easy to do. They continue. All these muheres have to do is drop from 5,000 calories a day to something like 2,500 calories a day and possibly walk a little too. Such drama queens. This was apparently tweeted by Refinery29. Using terms such as quarantine 15 when talking about pandemic weight is unhelpful at best and harmful at worst. They're talking about gaining 15 pounds over quarantine. They cite an article. My reaction to the COVID-15 is... Oh, here we go again, says Joy Cox, PhD, 
a body acceptance advocate, program development analyst of Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, and co-founder of the fitness app Jabby. Kangaroo replies, they forgot to mention that her PhD is in communication. And I looked up this app, Jabby. The first thing I found on Google was a fundraiser for it. They managed to raise $470 out of the $27,000 that they wanted. And I think this is from Instagram, the Jabby app. Jabby is the identity and body-affirming community wellness app revolutionizing how we define fitness. All that's fine, but despite searching for a while, I could not figure out what the Jabby app actually does. And that's probably why they fell short on their fundraising. When you have a product, you have to not only make it clear who it's for, but also what it actually does. Also, it's kind of misnamed. Jabby app sounds like either a drug-using app or an app to help you with diabetes. It does not sound like anything to do with uh, exercise or body affirm affirmation or anything like that. So exactly why should I care about this person's opinion, this Joy Cox, when they don't seem to understand some basics of business? Do they also not understand the basics of fat gain? Seems likely. La 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 brings us. Blair Peters tweets, Four queer surgeons perform a phalloplasty. How amazing to have an all-queer team of surgical trainees. And then somebody replies to that, Now make it fat. Gender-affirming surgeries must be available for all people, not just thin ones. Sarah B. It is, and like, nowhere in this tweet can you tell the weight of the patient. Your publishing BFF also replies, Also, notice no one on the surgical team is fat. Thin people have never been true allies of fat people. They're scared to become us and can't imagine anyone could like their fat bodies. And queer folks aren't excluded from that. It's a frustration I have with our community. This is pretty toxic. It's not enough that people are supportive. They also have to become like you. Alterado. So my ketamine doctor, who's just a general doctor, says I have prediabetes and I kind of just want to lie down and die. Like, I can't even do my laundry. And you want me to make diet and exercise changes? Someone replies to that, if you take any kind of steroid, they increase blood glucose. I don't know all the things that do, but there are many things that don't get talked about. I'm pretty convinced that whatever causes unwanted weight is what drives diabetes, and the weight is an indicator, not a cause. You know, I can agree with that. It's an indicator that you're probably eating unhealthy food, or that you're getting older and your body is starting to shut down. Either way, there's things you can do about it. The first person, well, my weight gain was pretty straightforwardly caused by Remeron. That's also another drug for depression. And the first person again, I just have no idea how to look at this through a fat, neutral, anti-fat phobic lens, you know? Like, I was looking at prediabetes and it said losing weight can help, and I'm like, really? How do you know? Considering we don't know how to make people lose weight? Because actually, in fact, some people do lose weight after learning they have prediabetes because they don't want to get diabetes. My dad lost weight when he found out he was getting prediabetes, and he lost like 80 pounds. The prediabetes went away. He's not the only person to ever achieve that, obviously. So that's how they know. Because people do it sometimes, and it works. Well, it works for many people, not always. They might also find that getting a little bit of exercise every day might help them with their depression. That might sound a little dismissive, but there's actual research showing that in many cases... Exercise helps more than the medications. I suspect it's the extra sunlight you're getting, but I can't prove that. So my advice for them, not that they'll listen, is to go out and spend 20 minutes walking every single day. Just 20 minutes. Naked Lobster brings us. There is a common lie that very low-calorie liquid diets jumpstart weight loss. All they do is activate the body's famine response. Weight loss by any method fails the vast majority of the time, and weight cycling does harm. Very low-calorie diets just exacerbate that harm. Invisible Space Vamp The actual problem with these liquid diets is they teach you nothing about what a well-balanced diet looks like. Why not address this issue instead? Because well-balanced diets don't exist in their reality, and their eating habits are already perfect? It's Taco O'Clocko. Ah yes, we can readily observe this every time there's been a famine. Everyone gets fat and lives. This is also why anorexia is so dangerous. When people starve themselves, they risk gaining weight to the point of immobility. 
One other minor thing they didn't talk about is when you do one of these low-calorie liquid diets and then you start eating food again, you will inevitably start gaining weight. First, because there's more, bo- more food in your body, because it doesn't immediately get expelled unlike the liquid, and you're probably eating more calories. Even though you're not gaining fat, necessarily, your body will start storing more water again, especially in the muscles, giving you more energy for exercise and things like that. Naked Lobster brings us. The diet industry likes to claim that people regain their weight because they went back to their old habits, which is a pretty disingenuous way of saying starvation isn't sustainable, and weight loss attempts lead to physiological changes that cause weight regain. Flashy Let replies, this is close to a real issue. Your stomach adjusts to how much you eat. If you consistently overeat, then once you cut down to what a normal person should eat, you will feel starving. These people eat a normal meal and are flabbergasted that that's all we eat, and the mental spiral begins. They feel starving, so they think we always feel starving. When all they have to do is make it just one week, feeling a bit hungry, and their body will adjust. According to WebMD, by the way, dieting doesn't actually shrink the stomach organ itself, and that once you're an adult, your stomach pretty much stays the same size unless you do some kind of operation or something. While your stomach itself doesn't shrink, your stomach does get used to not needing as much food to feel full. Dorkita brings us. It's a picture of some puppies. There isn't another thing on the planet that we would starve in the name of health. You are no different. Unfortunately, vets often do recommend limiting food intake for fat pets. Vets do often prescribe specific diets for weight management, which often involve feeding smaller amounts until the pet has lost enough weight. Pro-diet humans will literally starve anything fat in the name of health. This would probably read better as, no other creature but human starves itself, or its kind, to lose weight. Yes, yes, better to overfeed the dog and make it happy for just a few moments rather than spend an extra ten years with it. They totally have a good point here. I totally agree. Emo Banana brings us. It's a bunch of comments on a YouTube video. Amen. Clap. I'm not alone. Hubby and I have been together since April 2016, and I have gained 100 plus pounds since meeting him, and I've had multiple feelings of guilt, shame, and just sadness. Thank you for bravely sharing your truth and reminding me that I'm not alone. Clap. 100 pounds? Uh, absolutely not. You should be in a relationship with someone who wants you to be the best and healthiest version of yourself. This is the best and healthiest version of myself. Health doesn't have a body type. I'm so sorry people only love you when you're thin. That must be tough. But I guess if you only love others when they're thin, you deserve everything you get. I guess everything they get in this case would be a long and happy life with their spouse who also lives a long and happy life. Oh no. Huckster replies, as someone who gained over 100 pounds in a few years, that kind of weight gain is a sign of something very wrong mentally. It's not a lifestyle change. It's not something that happens to a developed adult in the normal course of things. If I'm dating someone normal weight and they gain 20 pounds over a period of time, no problem. I do not expect a partner to maintain their exact body throughout the years, particularly if they have an active lifestyle and our life together prevents that same exact lifestyle. But 50 plus pounds? I didn't sign up for this. I will absolutely stay by them if they acknowledge that there's some deeper issue that they are working on. But if the attitude is, teehee, I'm so glad my man accepts me for all my flaws instead of pushing me to work on them, I just, nope. The entire time I was gaining that weight, I knew I had problems and I needed to sort them. And I wouldn't expect a partner to have to deal with me at my worst. I wouldn't blame them for moving on. But if I refuse to even work on it, I'd hope my partner had the sense to move on if I refused to help myself. From professional something. The photo on the left was six years ago during my high school prom, and the one on the right, my high school reunion. I was depressed and beyond miserable back then. Even though I weigh 550 pounds now, I truly love myself. Loving your body is about being comfortable in your body, and only you get to set the parameters of that. Only you get to decide what that looks like, and only you know what the, where the finish line is. Never let anyone make you feel ashamed about what you decide or don't decide to put on your body. You can be healthy at any size. Once people accept that, you can spread love and happiness. OCR Amazon, six years ago, at prom. So this lady is max 24 years old. 
She ain't going to be healthy at 550 for long. Realistically, she's at midlife right now. Jamalim. My friend was around that weight. Actually, I think she was closer to 500, but still, and happy. Until she was around 30 and sustained an injury to her foot. She became bedbound over it and was gone by age 34. I wish I was making that up. Invisible Space Vamp adds, My aunt died from a similar cause. Morbidly obese. Had a pretty harmless injury on her leg which wouldn't heal properly because of diabetes. Developed sepsis and died of multi-organ failure. Significant ad brings us something a lot less serious. If you're struggling with belly weight, PCOS, or insulin resistance, look up sugar doors. Mine opened up today, 32 minutes into my workout. Ancient matter explains what sugar doors are. It appears to be a pseudoscientific tick-tock trend that is predicated on the debunked carbohydrates insulin model of obesity. I'm guessing the idea is that you work out for a certain amount of time burning only sugar, then after that you burn only fat. The problem with this kind of thing is that if, even if it was true, what happens later in the day is your body will just burn whatever's available. So if you've burned a lot of sugar already, it'll later burn a lot of fat. And if you've burned a lot of fat already, it'll start burning a lot of sugar. Either way, the only thing that really matters in terms of weight gain and loss, in terms of something like this, is the total number of calories. You can't trick your body to only burn sugar and not burn fat. Or trick your body to only burn fat and not burn sugar. Dorkita brings us, does anyone have any good resources for guidance on an intuitive eating, gentle nutrition approach to management of gestational diabetes? I know I've seen many posts regarding eating with diabetes in general, and how it's a myth that you can't eat sugar. I think the tips I have seen refer to pairing sugar with other food groups and spreading out consumption over the course of the day. I was able to Google resources for diabetes in general, but as soon as I added the word gestational to the search, all the content switched to the removing sugar approach, despite my search term still containing gentle nutrition. Is management of gestational diabetes genuinely different? Or is there just not the same amount of IE content out there about it? A friend of mine is in the seventh month of a very challenging pregnancy for many reasons, and just last week said, at least I can still enjoy a cake. Now, today she's been told she has gestational diabetes and needs to avoid sugar, and she's feeling really discouraged. You know, it's pretty obvious why there's no nutritionists and uh, dietitians out there giving bad advice for gestational diabetes. If something happens in terms of gestational diabetes and the baby dies, you've got a lawsuit on your hands. So all these dietitians and nutritionists could be easily, easily sued. Obviously, the best advice is to listen to your doctor. God damn. Alterado brings us this movie on Netflix. A guy. He bought his mom a wheelchair. She's not even sick or anything, just fat. Woman. Sometimes fat means sick. Guy shrugs, leaves her room. Sometimes fat means sick. Fat phobia is real. OCR Amazon. You'd think the more fat phobic part would be needing to buy someone a wheelchair for no reason besides them being fat. Whoa. Fat isn't limiting. They should be screaming. Swiffer Ponsu Sniffer brings us. Somebody commented on something. Actually, that is possible. If she only ate broccoli the entire day, she'd go below her maintaining caloric intake, and her body would go into starvation mode and store all the consumed fat food as fat. If she exercises on top of that, it creates lots of stress on the body. OCR Amazon. Yeah, they'd store all that broccoli as fat. They'd balloon to 500 pounds. That's why every raw vegan is morbidly obese. <laughs> Olivia Olive brings us another person just commenting crazy stuff. He goes to the gym, but a lot of people don't eat well and still stay slim. Out of all my friends, the two who live off junk and don't do any exercise are so skinny. The ones who are slim to medium eat okay, but don't call it healthy. More like a mix. Me, I don't like most junk food. I hate the taste of anything fatty, yet I'm big. I do have a medical issue. I produce too much insulin, and my body uses very little on energy. So just about everything gets stored as fat. The only way to fix it is to not eat anything that will trigger insulin, which is very hard. I'm doing it. I'm determined to get healthy and lose weight, but it really shows that genetics plays a huge role on how our bodies handle food. 
I have no idea what disease this person could be suffering from, unless they just mean diabetes, in which case they should probably be doing something about that. Grouchy reflection replies to the parts where they're talking about other people's eating habits. Unless they're under lab condition observation 24-7, there's no way she could know how other people eat. I believe this kind of flawed thinking is called snapshotting, and it's an aspect of the wonky object constancy you get in some personality disorders. For example, I see Mary eating a massive pizza at a work event. I recognize it's a special occasion and unlikely to be a reflection of how Mary eats the rest of the time. She might not eat at all the following day, because she'd still be full. Brenda sees Mary eating a massive pizza at work event, and takes a mental snapshot that Mary is that girl who eats massive pizzas all the time. It's a bit like a mate of mine who mentioned in passing that she thought a picture of a frog she saw was cute. A relative interpreted this as her being wild about frogs, and now my mate has a ton of tacky frog-related knickknacks from this relative. <laughs> oh god. People are more than just a snapshot, but some personality disordered folks. Only see that one aspect of a person and hyper-focus on it. I don't know much about this. I wonder what personality disorder would give you this kind of impression. I thought, I thought it was just not thinking about things very much. Alfaba brings us. I went in for my routine thyroid check. I go once a year for the thyroid condition I've been diagnosed with since 16. Before I get blood drawn, I talk with the doctor. Instead of being curious about the various significant medical issues that had changed for me in the last year, she congratulated me on an, for a fat person, insignificant amount of weight loss. I was stunned. I haven't had a medical provider do that unprompted ever. Kind of suggests that she's never lost weight before. They continue, instead of being worried or concerned about issues I may be having, chronic illnesses, mismanaged medications, mental health, is she saying she mismanaged her own medications? Continuing, she congratulated me. I was shocked. I went through so much medical trauma in the last year. I've been treated so poorly at the doctors. And here's another doctor who should be curious and concerned about weight changes. Instead of approaching with concern to make sure I was okay, I was told, good job. Good job having the worst medical year of my life because it resulted in unintended weight loss. I have no scales at home. I only know me size when going to a doctor. I can't tell if that's a typo or if they come from part of the UK where people use the word me to mean my. Doctors, if your fat patients lose significant weight, don't applaud them. She actually said that for her it was an insignificant amount of weight loss. She's changing her tune. Which was it? She continues, ask what's going on. My weight shift should have been clocked earlier as a reaction to medication. Anti-fat bias in medicine kills fat people. Other fat folk have died have been severely harmed in medicine because of their size. It's inappropriate to celebrate weight loss. If your client brings it up celebrating, then that's your K. I think she meant to write Q with a C, but instead she wrote a Spanish word. Otherwise, treat me like a straight-sized patient who came in with those symptoms. You'd be worried not celebrating. It's so inhumane to live in a society that has anti-fat bias. Anti-fat bias kills people. Do better. Medical fat phobia. BMI. Weight stigma. The main thing I notice about this person is they're both obese, I'm guessing morbidly obese, and they're suffering from a multitude of health problems. It seems incredibly likely that they're both related, and that if she lost weight through healthier eating, a lot of these medical problems would maybe not go away, but they'd become a lot lighter. Hittle er blowfish brings us. Just a reminder that being fat isn't a health condition. It's no different than losing your hair, going through menopause, or growing older. It affects how people treat us. It affects how we see ourselves. It affects how we experience life. But it's not a condition. How about being weighed for an asthma check? Is it necessary? Of course not. You literally never need to be weighed unless you're losing weight unintentionally. You're on a strict fluid balance regimen. For example, kidney failure. Or they need your weight for medication dosing, which is rare. OCR Amazon replies, You never need to be weighed unless your weight is dropping, which they won't know unless they weigh you. Separate ad. Asking your doctor not to weigh you is like putting a piece of electric tape over the check engine light. Cat comes back adds, When I struggled with an eating disorder, I said I'll close my eyes. The scale didn't allow turning around. And please to not be told the number or shown it. Boom. That easy. 
Fly hat stuff brings us. When are people going to realize bigger doesn't mean unhealthy, food-wise or just in general? There's people who are fat because of health reasons or genetics and eat healthy 24-7. Skinny doesn't mean healthy, nor does it mean you're automatically attractive. Get over yourselves. If someone wants to make it known that it's okay to be fat while eating healthy, knowing it's not food that is the reason, then you should learn a thing or two, rather than starving yourself to be a pick-me. Be confident in your own skin is beautiful enough. Stop projecting your ugly onto others. I have PCOS and now have hyperthyroidism after having my daughter. Currently gaining weight because of the medication I'm on so I won't die. So I'm well aware fat isn't always food related. Argue with your mother, not me. Fickle Jelly replies, You can eat healthy and still gain weight if you eat 24-7. Besides, some people confuse stuff that's unhealthy with healthy. A mac and cheese chicken wings Twinkie salad has the word salad in it. Must be healthy. Or that post from a couple of months ago, where the person was drowning their salad in ranch, and still insisted it was healthy. Invisible Space Vamp. Healthy doesn't mean low-calorie either. Like, there are healthy fats, but if you drown your vegetables in olive oil, they still have a lot of calories. Or smoothies. All natural, only fruit, no added sugar. One of these drinks can be easily 500 calories. Red gumdrop, or nuts, those little suckers can turn into so many calories if you're not measuring them, even though they're a healthy snack. I hate Melvin. My homemade pistachio butter was about a third of how I became overweight. Other two-thirds being hummus and avocados. I had no idea how caloric they were, and was trying to eat healthier. I was dumb. Do not be like me, kids. Can I ask for a friend, who's been very active recently, brings us another one. This is a registered dietitian. When everyone around you starts going on New Year, New You diets, it's helpful to take the long view. Remember that although some people might have a few months or even a few years of seemingly success on diets, it most likely won't last and often causes harm in the long run. Grouchy Reflection replies, Same energy as my toxic parents. I'm no contact now. Screaming at me that moving hundreds of miles away for a job was a bad idea and I'd fail. Turned into a successful career that they continuously mocked and belittled, even though my mother was a kept woman who never worked. It came from a place of envy and intentional sabotage, because they have to drag people down to elevate themselves as opposed to improving themselves. Fat acceptance continuously reminds me of my parents, particularly my mother, because they do all the same stuff and it's all from the same place of cripplingly low self-esteem. Alterado brings us a Venn diagram and for once it appears to be done correctly. The two circles that are intersecting are Christian fundamentalism and diet culture. I'm not going to go through every single one, but some of the examples of Christian fundamentalism are attaining spiritual perfection through behavioral obedience, base desires are sinful, fear of hell, diet culture, good and bad foods, exercise to earn food, thinness is ultimate value, Food and body types assigned morality. Whatever. I'm not saying I agree with any of this. And here's where they intersect. They both want a rigid control of the body. I guess. Black and white thinking. It seems like this Venn diagram itself is very black and white thinking. Putting all Christian fundamentalism into the same circle, even though there's a lot of variation in it. Pleasure is bad. I'm actually pretty sure that diet culture doesn't care about pleasure. In fact, if there were healthy foods that were pleasurable, it would encourage it. Purity-centric, I guess. Strict moral codes. I'm pretty sure diet culture says nothing about morality, so there, that is incorrect. Denial of mortality. That's a weird one, because I believe Christian fundamentalism believes that you will die. And diet culture also believes that you will eventually die. You're just trying to extend your time on Earth and make it more healthy. Anyway, it continues on like that. And the last one is mind versus body dualism. That's actually more prominent in fat acceptance culture, where they talk about being in a fat body. Like there's just some passenger riding around. Naked Lobster brings us. Hi, I'm profoundly uncomfortable with claims about my mistreatment and the mistreatment of people who look like me being grounded in assertions about the truth of or falsity of obesity science. Trying to get rid of a whole group of people is condemnable. 
because it's trying to get rid of a whole group of people. Challenging the justification for those efforts is working on the wrong point in the chain. It doesn't contest the elimination efforts, it contests the basis. So many spiders. Oh, for fudge's sake. Losing weight is not tantamount to... Word I can't say. You delusional children. At this point, I'm ready to just throw up my hands and go, you know what? Eat the cookies. Be a toddler and have candy and cake for every meal. Just don't cry about the consequences you inflicted on yourself. Naked Lobster brings us. In 50 years, we're going to look back at this time of body and organ mutilation in service of white supremacist aesthetic standards with shame and anger. Yeah, I think we're actually going to look back at this time and go, wow, we let that stuff be in food that was sold everywhere? I can't believe it. People must have gotten so fat. That must have taken 20 years off people's lives. Can I ask for a friend, brings us. Basically, anyone who's dieted has engaged in disordered eating behaviors. Christy Harrison. Groucher Reflection replies, Disordered behavior. Eating toilet paper, punching yourself in the stomach, eating roll after roll of antacids, misusing medication to get rid of Hogner pain. Disordered eating is not eating more vegetables and ditching fizzy drinks. These people make a mockery of patients genuinely struggling with actual restriction. Ugh, I'm going to slaughter this name. I could not find on the internet how to pronounce it. Cord Airy brings us. Thin privileges having an eating disorder be cared about and not encouraged by your family, friends, doctors, and society as a whole. Thin privilege is actually being able to be considered anorexic and not labeled with atypical anorexia just because you're not thin. They know that the word atypical isn't a judgment, right? It just means not the usual. Like, it's not an insult. Tehanu replies, why, yes, as everyone knows, having anorexia is extremely privileged. What a sane and thoughtful opinion. You will literally need a different treatment as a non-underweight person with restrictive eating disorder, even if you suffer differently. It's a diagnostic criteria. Get a grip. Another one from Fat Logic. I'm five foot four and 200 plus pounds, but don't look it. I was 135 in high school and looked sickly. Now I'm confident and curvy. Sounds like a win-win to me. Anna Schock replies, As someone who is about 200 pounds and six foot four, yeah, this woman is not curvy. Curves and rolls are different, but years of euphemistic language have made people forget that. Here's another post. Your best weight isn't actually a number, but rather a feeling. When you focus on your behaviors instead of your weight, your body will naturally find its best ideal weight. This isn't something a chart can pinpoint for you. And that weight can be different for every single person. Think about it this way. A chihuahua and a German shepherd are both fab. But starving the shepherd to try to get them to look like the smaller one wouldn't make them healthier, right? Same with humans. You've heard it, and you're dumber now for having heard it. Grouchy Reflection replies, Comparing a chihuahua and German shepherd would be like comparing Bushwick Bill from the Ghetto Boys and Andre the Giant. Bill was three foot eight, 110 pounds, and Andre was seven foot four, 520 pounds. Both were adult human men, but built completely differently and with dramatically different caloric needs. On a side note, it always shocks me when I'm reminded that there's five foot one women who weigh the same, if not more, as a literal giant who was a rare freak of nature and think it's perfectly normal. And it's worth mentioning that Andre the Giant only lived to be 46. Here's another post. It's honestly really easy to understand as long as you're not obnoxiously obtuse. Psychology and biology often go hand in hand, and the brain quite literally cannot tell the difference between a stressful situation and a life or death situation. If someone is stressed for a long period of time, the brain will send a message to the body to conserve fat as a precautionary measure. Same for low hydration. If you're not getting enough hydration, your body will assume you're in danger and will once again conserve fat. Eating a lot does the opposite of what you think it does in terms of weight gain. Not eating at all makes you gain more weight than eating a lot. Exercise rarely does anything at all to help with weight loss either. Oof, really jumped off the deep end there at the end. 
Here's another post. A client. The only way I'm going to be truly happy again is if I get my old body back. Me. Let's flip back in time. Did you feel happy then? Client. Damn. Izzy. No, but I was suffering from untreated clinical depression and used food to self-medicate, so I would be much happier now if I lost that weight since the depression is now treated. Ms. Beaver brings us. Are large body people more at risks of cancer because of their fat, or is it because they put off seeing the doctor, and that the doctor is more likely not to do a physical check? This logic only half makes sense. Let's assume the doctors are doing their job badly. That would indeed cause obese people to die more often from cancer. Yes, but it would not increase the risk obese people have of getting cancer because it would go undetected, so it would appear that the risk is lower than it actually is. People would just die and the doctor would be like, I don't know what killed them. Obesity, I guess. Even though they had cancer. But instead what we find is that people who are obese have a greater risk of getting cancer and have a greater risk of dying of cancer. So, wah wah. Try again. The New York Times has, I guess, an opinion piece. Weight discrimination is legal. Should New York change that? The city council is expected to approve a bill this spring that would ban weight discrimination in hiring and housing. You know, that could be a good or bad thing depending on exactly how it's worded. But in this article, their examples are kind of, way, uh, kind of weak. Some workers have unsuccessfully filed lawsuits over weight discrimination, including a bus driver who lost his job after failing a medical exam. We need more details about this medical exam. Exactly how did they fail? Did they fail by being obese or by having a lot of other medical issues? Although, is it fair that people are being fired for having medical issues? And a New York City firefighter who was told to lose 71 pounds in 30 days. You know what? I feel no sympathy for the firefighter. This is a job where it's incredibly important that you stay in good physical shape because your job is to literally carry people out of burning buildings. So if the law is going to protect overweight, out of shape firefighters, I am not for it. This was in Futurology. 77% of young Americans are too fat, mentally ill, or uh, using illegal substances to join the military, Pentagon study finds. Since the US does a lot of things to support the military, does this mean that the government is finally going to do something about obesity so that the military can get more people? They pushed for better dental care back in the day, will they now push for better foods to be available? Time will tell. Here's a recent study that came out in the BMJ. It says, Dietary Sugar Consumption and Health, Umbrella Review. They looked at about 73 meta-analyses from 8,601 unique articles. This is like a summary of all the research that's out there. And what they found was that if you eat more than 25 grams of added sugar a day, it has adverse health effects. And they want you to keep sugary beverages down to less than one a week. Anything more than that is harmful for your cardiometabolic health. That's a very low level, actually. One can of soda has more than 25 grams of sugar. It's only about 100 grams. Note that this is talking about added sugar. So the sugar that you get from eating a piece of fruit, that doesn't count. In fact, fruit and vegetables, despite having sugar in them, have been shown to make your life longer, or at least be correlated with making your life longer. Hey, you've made it to the end of the video. If you liked the video, consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing. If you really liked it, consider becoming a member. Members at the two highest levels get their name read out as a thank you every time I make one of these videos. Members at the highest level also get a short video every couple of weeks as well about something fat logic related. Any help you can give me is of course always much appreciated. I'd like to thank top members Emmett McNally, Rig, Cupcaker Death, MMC, Megtran2000. Gato, that one guy, Maria P, average loser, Wolf Child Rusk, just a girl, I cuddle cats, and Orle Christine. Your support is very much appreciated. I wish all of you wonderful people a wonderful day.